Hi there, friends of the Neon Museum. My name is Dave Schwartz. I'm the scholar in residence for spring of 2020, and I'm thrilled to be here in the NE10 studios to talk with you a little bit about the early corporate era of Las Vegas and how that impacted the visual language of the strip. Uh, the talk is called After Howard, Hughes, of course, and Before the Mirage. So let's dive right into it. What I'd like to speak with you about is a little bit about what this period was, what do I mean by it, what made it distinct, how is it different from what came before and what came later, and why it matters. Why should we care about this period at all? Okay, so first, what was the early corporate era? And there we see a rendering of the Flamingo in its earliest stages of renovation. They started by adding one tower, and today it's all towers. So a very brief sketch of Las Vegas history, casino history at least, is you have the prehistory of the modern gaming industry from 1905, the founding of Las Vegas, until 1931 when, legal, when gaming was re-legalized in the Silver State. You then have the early period, which was from about 1931 to 1950. Then you have what people call the classic era, the Rat Pack era, and that's from around 1950 to about 1966. Following that, they say pretty much everything after 1966 is the corporate era. And it's all the same. It's all when the big corporations came and took over, came in and took over. So I'd like to talk about this a little bit differently with a little bit more nuance, where we have the first three stages are the same up until 1966. Then I would say, from 1967 to 1989, we have the early corporate era. 1990 to 2001, I would call the Mirage era. And then today, we are in the modern era, which historians someday will give it a name. But we don't have one yet, because we're still in it. So the early corporate era, that's what I'm going to focus on here, starts with Howard Hughes buying into the Nevada gaming market in 1967 with the Desert Inn, and then a few others that we'll talk about later. In that same year, 1967, the legislature amended its laws to allow publicly traded companies to own casinos. That's significant. And it ends with the opening of the Mirage on November 22, 1989. In this period, public companies came into Nevada Gaming, into Las Vegas. In this period, you had the last scandals from the mob era as we had the last skimming scandals, the stuff that was made famous in the movie Casino, that's happening in this period, and it's obviously very different from the 90s. You also have this trend towards bigger resorts where they start building really, really big ones. Let's talk about Howard Hughes really quickly. He bought the Desert Inn. I have some facts there on the slide. I don't think I need to belabor them. It's a very interesting story how he did it. Basically, he checked in didn't want to leave after about a month, and he bought it for over $13 million. Then he buys the Sands. This was the famous haunt of Frank Sinatra. And what he called the clan or the summit, he did not like the term Rat Pack, but we use it anyway, because Frank doesn't always win, for better or for worse. OK, so we have the Sands. We then have the Castaways, which was a smaller casino that he bought, Howard Hughes bought, the Frontier was another one. The Silver Slipper, which we have a Silver Slipper sign in the museum. And of course, the story that circulates and is sort of impossible to debunk is that Howard Hughes was disturbed by the glowing, flashing slipper. So he bought the Silver Slipper casino to turn it off. In fact, his room was facing the opposite direction and was totally covered up with blackout curtains the whole time he was there. So he did have a pretty good view of the golf course, but he never wanted to look out the window, and he didn't have to. Silver Slipper and the Landmark, which he bought before it was finished and opened it. And that was a very famous story there, how that happened. So Howard Hughes coming in really changed the industry. It gave it a lot more legitimacy and really paved the way for other people to come in. Before that could happen, though, they had to change the law. The existing Nevada gaming laws said that if you wanted to invest in a casino, they needed to investigate you first. This made a lot of sense because you had people connected to the mob trying 
I'll say in quotes, trying to get into the Nevada gaming industry, and this is a way to keep them out. So it made a lot of sense. But it kept publicly traded corporations out. Because they sold their stock over the counter, there was no way to investigate everybody who owned stock. So first they allowed for the registration of people with stock, then they allowed publicly traded companies to basically buy in. People over a certain threshold, 10% had to be licensed, but people who just bought the stock and it was less than 10%, no problem. And that really led to a lot of corporate investment. Okay, so in this period, the early corporate era, we have changes in how casinos are owned. They're now being owned instead of by these small syndicates, by these big companies who have to build shareholder value. There's more formal procedures enacted. It's no longer, hey, you know, Jimmy B, who I knew from back in Cleveland, is going to come in and shoot craps and we'll give him a room. It's now, okay, we have a spreadsheet, and the spreadsheet says these players get rooms and these players don't. Much more formal. There's a lot more control over costs. It's no longer, hey, it's Christmas, everybody reach into the drop boxes and grab a $100 bill. There's your bonus. I'm not saying they literally did that, but cash controls were pretty loose back in the old days. That stuff no longer passes muster. It's much tighter. And basically, casinos had to make more money. Because they were bigger, they had higher overhead, they had to make more money also because they had the shareholders to answer to. They needed to make more money. So there's a couple of changes. Basically, it changes not only how they operate, but also in the end how they look. And there's a very distinctive look to these casinos in this period. So I want to talk now a little bit about what made it distinct. How can we tell this is in the early corporate period and not what came before or after? Well, the classic Rat Pack era casinos are low to the ground, mostly one or two stories. Riviera was an outlier. They were expansive. They took up a lot of space. You know, think of the old sands. You had basically the casino building and a bunch of other buildings with hotel rooms in it, stretching really far out, eventually even a heliport in there. Not, and this is not to offend any of the architects who designed the buildings, but they're not really distinctive. I think they'd be the first to admit it. If you think about the old sands, it was basically a bunch of two-story buildings. Nothing really stood out, except for the sign. These are why the signs of classic Las Vegas were so distinctive, were so memorable, because this was basically a casino's one shot to make an impression. This was the biggest thing on the property, only shot they had. Because of this, they were really cool. They're, we recognize them as being works of art, as being really fun. Okay, they don't just convey information. So here's a couple of signs from the classic era. Here we have the El Rancho Vegas. And you can see there's a kind of big sign in front. And then the windmill is the big feature. And their advertising literally said, stop at the sign of the windmill. Okay, here's another omnibus picture we have the El Rancho Vegas again. We have the Sahara with a big sign there, and the dunes with its famous fiberglass sultan. Here's a good one. This is in the transition. This is a beautiful sign, their first sign. And again, this really says, hey, don't look at the thousand rooms behind here. Look at this. This is what's exciting. Here's where it's at. Here's a later photo from the 70s. You can see the facade did continue. And here's another great one from the 70s. And you can see, really, the sign still is the most distinctive thing. You know, that sign you are going to remember. The other part of the building, not so much. Pretty plain. So another big change that happened in the classic era leading into the early corporate era is that casino resorts got a lot bigger. When I started doing this research, people would talk about, well, the El Rancho Vegas Casino and the MGM Grand Casino. Talk about them as like they're the same thing. And as I got more into the research, I realized, well, hey, the El Rancho Vegas had 63 hotel rooms. MGM Grand opened with 5,005. You, know, you can't say that those are identical things. They're very different. Just the scale is different. So El Rancho Vegas, first casino, what became the Strip, opens in 1941 with 63 rooms. The Sands, 11 years later, has 200 rooms, 1952. And it cost four and a half million to build. Riviera has 250 rooms in 1955, but 
they're in a high-rise building, not in the low um, wings of hotel rooms. The Stardust, which has the low wings at first, has about a thousand rooms, and that's kind of the limit of the size. They can't really get any bigger. You can't go back that far. People will get lost and delirious trying to get back to the room. This is why the Sands and many of the other casinos actually have golf carts and little trams to take their guests back to their room. Okay, Caesar's Palace opens in 1966 with 680 rooms. Some of them were in the low rise, many of them were in the tower, that famous tower. Then we have the real category breaker, which is the International. International opens up in 1969 with 1,500 rooms. And clearly, this is something totally different. We'll talk about that. Then the MGM Grand. Four years later, Kirk Kerkorian builds the MGM Grand with 2,100 rooms when it opened. Eventually, they both expand to about 3,000. So to do this, you have to go vertical. So Riviera is the first high rise. And I can't imagine a 5,000 room hotel that's two stories tall. I just don't know where it would go. So Caesars Palace had both, as I said. After Caesars, every major resort is gonna be a high rise. They don't mess around with the low rise buildings anymore. Land is too expensive and they have to get a return on their investment. So the International, like I said, did set that new model. You've got that low flat building with the casino and the theater and the restaurants and then the high rise tower. So here's a shot of the International after it became the Hilton. As you can see, if you think back to that first El Rancho Vegas with the windmill, this is something really different. There's no way you're gonna miss that building. It's big, it's Y-shaped, and at this point it has a giant Hilton logo slapped on the side. So the size of the building, the exterior changes, the interior changes too. Slot machines come to dominate because slot machines have variable pay tables, they can be advertised. So you don't just say we have slot machines, you say we have 98% payback slot machines, which is something they like to advertise, which they didn't really do for table games. It was just assumed you've got table games. The focus on mass gambling instead of high rollers means they are now catering to people who are gonna be attracted by good payoff percentages for slots. So they're putting this on their signs. Okay. Entertainment also changes. Except for Caesar's Palace in this early corporate period and eventually MGM Grand and the Hilton, International Hilton too, casinos are a lot more cost conscious. They switch to reviews. And you know, for a book I'm researching, I'm looking at Las Vegas Entertainment in the 70s and 80s. And you can see it went from being a lot of headline entertainers to switching in the 80s to be mostly reviews and tribute artists and shows like that with a couple of headliners. And yeah, by 1980, most casinos in the Strip don't even have headliners. Maybe once or twice a year for a big event. Okay, and they're basically, the reviews are coexisting with headliners and other casinos. So now, as we're into the 70s, into this period, the building really dominates over the sign. You're no longer going to have something like the Dunes where you've got a two-story building and a 15-story sign. It's much different. The sign now doesn't signify the resort. It's not the identity of the resort anymore. It just gives information. The signs tend to get bigger, but also a lot plainer. There's a lot less what we would call art involved, even though they do have an element of art. And the reader board becomes the big feature. Okay, and there's just a couple decorative flourishes. Now, there are some exceptions. The flamingo's feathers, which you saw on our opening slide and which you might see are kind of weaved into the background here very faintly so it doesn't distract from the writing. And the stardust sign, of course, are some exceptions in this period. So here's an example. The sand sign evolved over the 44-year history of the resort. First, it was just the sand's logo with this huge S. Nothing else. Then they added the reader boards. Finally, they redesigned it in 1982 with a much smaller logo and a really big reader board. So here's some examples. So here are the original sand sign on the left, and of course, the famous version from Ocean's Eleven on the right there. Okay, here we see the sand sign in action with the two reader boards, and then finally, this would be circa 
I think, February or March of 1982, because it's advertising Top Secret, which is a very short-lived review at the Sands, we see the redesigned sign. Now in this, what I find interesting is that the size of the S is really small. You saw in that original sign, it dominates. You really look at the Sands. Whatever's on that reader board, which in this case is Top Secret, the review, and the return on slots, that's what they want you to see. And you've got the sand sign and the logo. So here's some other examples. This is the Tropicana. And this is a great shot because we have the sign which predated the towers. The towers that came in the 70s and 80s obviously are much bigger than the sign. And the sign is now almost all reader board. The Tropicana originally had that fountain out front that signified the trop. Now it's pretty much a giant reader board which just Tropicana written across the top. You're playing. Here's another good example. So we have the Flamingo, the pre-corporate era Flamingo. As you'll see here, we have the Flamingo in the brush script and of course the famous Champagne Tower. And what happened in the corporate era? Well, we get this. Big hotel tower that you're not going to miss and the famous feathered logo for the Flamingo. And here's another look at it. As you can tell, I kind of like uh, the Flamingo sign. And you can see around the building, there's that information at more at street level for people. Here's some other cool things, just juxtaposing the sign in the building for the Sahara. You can see there's quite a difference there. And MGM Grand, the original MGM Grand, which is now Bally's. As you can see, building dominates. We have a big port of Cachet. The sign was out front. I have a picture of the sign on the next slide. But take a look at this. And then here we see the sign in relation to the building. And again, it's MGM and a pretty plain logo and mostly reader board advertising their entertainment. Okay, another casino here is the Desert Inn. Okay, so here we have the Desert Inn as it went to high rise and it still for a while had the famous cactus logo on top. Then it shifts to this more modernistic corporate mirrored look, and you see the sign is reader board dominated. Here we have the Thunderbird, which is another good one. And of course, the international sign, which is mostly reader board. Finally, Caesar's Palace, which does have the decorative flourishes, but is mostly conveying information, although it looks like a fun place. Then here we have slots of fun. This is a nice just look at something, building not that distinctive, what do you notice first? The sign, because the building is only one story tall, so the sign is the focus there, not so much the reader board. Okay, here we have the Aladdin, and you remember the old, old Aladdin lamp? Well, that's changed, it's now taken maybe a secondary focus. Here's another very famous one, this is the Hacienda Horse and Rider, which you may have seen one or two places around town still. And there we have the corporate era hacienda with Red Fox. Okay, what was downtown like though? What were the downtown casinos like? Well, here we have, going back to the 30s, here is the Western Casino. And you can see, dominated by neon, a lot of information at street level, and it is just wrapping the building there. And of course, this eventually became Binion's Horseshoe, and then later Binion's. And there's the Hotel Apache. Okay, we see in the early corporate era, downtown hotels stick to this same general idea. It's a lot flashier than it was. The neon is much more elaborate, but it's the same idea of let's kind of wrap our first floor in the neon and tell people who we are. Here we have the Lady Luck, a little bit off Fremont Street, but I also like this because it's a great example of that very street-facing, very pedestrian-friendly neon. And of course, the sign on the side of the building. So why does all this matter besides it being really cool to look at pictures of old Vegas? And you know, I could do that forever. Why am I doing it today? Why does it matter? Well, I want to talk about why it ended, and that helps us put it into perspective. The Mirage, which opened in 1989, totally changed the way people in Las Vegas thought about designing casinos. It was a very tightly integrated facility. You had everything 
just in one big piece, from the rooms to the restaurants to the parking garage, which hadn't really been seen before. If you look at the older, even what's now Bally's, what's now the Westgate, they hadn't really figured out the parking garage. It's not until the Mirage that they do that it's part of it from the beginning. It's also on a larger scale. It's not like the Flamingo, which started with low-rise rooms, then one tower, then more towers. From the beginning, this is going to be a 3,000-room resort, and it's built accordingly. The signs from the beginning are secondary. Okay, think of Luxor, think of Excalibur, think of the Stratosphere, think of New York, New York. You don't really think of the sign, you think of the building profile, you think of the skyline. Okay, we can put, you can have a silhouette of the skyline and you'll know which building is which. That wouldn't have been true back in 1958, for the most part. Okay, so other stuff is what's important. You know, or other stuff. So Steve Wynn liked his volcanoes and pirate ships. At Paris, they have the Eiffel Tower. Okay, that's the focus. It generally leads to a sleeker visual design. So why did signs change? Well, a couple reasons. First of all, the technology changes. Neon is no longer the best way to do this. You can now have LEDs and all sorts of moving things. There's a lot more entertainment available. So you need a lot more stuff to advertise. You can't just put up the one reader board with, hey, it's top secret and it's going to be here for three months, although we want it for longer. You now might have three or four or five different shows going on at once, and you don't want to just put one on your marquee. Basically, the signs evolve to hold screens, not to be artistic by themselves. Think of the signs for Aria or Cosmopolitan or Link. Okay, these signs, you wouldn't say, ah, or win. You wouldn't say, ah, that's the link sign or the win side. It's, oh, that's a pretty nice screen. That's how they evolved. Treasure Island, for a while, is an outlier. And we're very lucky to have that in the Boneyard here at the Neon Museum. That's a little bit of an outlier. But in the corporate era, most of the other ones are really functional. So what does this mean, the fact that we have these changes? Well, to me, it means that this early corporate era was important. We're looking at how a city learned to market to a mass audience and learned to market gambling to a mass audience, which I think is very important for history because we hadn't really had this kind of mass marketing before. We see operators in the city experimenting with building. You know, how do we build a 3,000 room hotel? How do we run it? How do we pay for it? They're figuring that out. In this period, they do the trial and error that paves the way for the mega resort period. So by the time 1989 rolls around, if somebody says, I want to build a 3,000 room hotel on the Strip, they can go to investors and lenders and say, OK, hey, here's what works, here's what doesn't. They figured it out already. And basically, this changes all of Las Vegas, as this new money comes in, it changes everything. A lot of the resorts in this period are still around. So the Westgate, the Flamingo, which was an expansion, the Tropicana's expansion, Bally's, Caesar's Palace. Even though you can't really recognize Caesar's Palace, the nugget of the building, that original tower in the casino, is still there. And they show how these designs were really durable compared to the ones in the previous era. You know, nobody really thought twice about tearing down those two-story hotel wings. These ones are really more substantial buildings, and I think they're interesting. A lot of them are gone, though. A lot of them have disappeared. So what this shows, why this really matters, it shows what happens when an industry suddenly says, we're going to do things differently. Yes, for the past 20 years, People have been able to drive up to their rooms, and they've been low-rise. We're going to go high-rise. It shows that neon was really a lucky happenstance. You had a particular kind of sign technology with a particular group of artists and casino owners with a particular need. And they all came together in this one period where they just had this need and it all combined to produce the neon signage that we have preserved today. 
also shows, so as we get into the corporate period, it shows that just because something is bigger and more expensive doesn't mean it's going to be considered more artistic or more refined. All right? Bigger isn't always better. It also shows that designers of casinos or hotels or anything make a lot of choices when they're designing their buildings, what they're going to look like, what message they're going to send. And I think it is very important for us to be able to sit back, walk around the Neon Museum, and consider what choices were made in the past and how we can commemorate it in the future. So thank you very much. I really enjoy that you spent some time with me today. Um, even though we're not here in person, you spent some time virtually with me here in the NE10 studios, surrounded by all these great signs, and uh, I hope it was worthwhile.